Drivers and manufacturers get all the glory when you go racing, because they're the ones you see on the track. But they wouldn't be very good if they didn't have mechanics. And if you're going to talk about mechanics, you gotta talk about the greatest mechanic, arguably, of all time. The ultimate rule bender, the forward thinker, Henry Smokey Eunuch. Henry Eunuch was born to Ukrainian immigrants in 1923. He grew up on a farm in Pennsylvania, and when his father died, he dropped out of school and went back to work on the farm. While he was working there, he quickly found a knack for improvised and clever solutions, such as building a tractor out of the wreckage of a car. And Henry took that knowledge to his growing motorcycle passion. And one of those motorcycles must have been burning oil one day, because his exhaust was nothing but a smoke screen earning him his famous nickname, Smokey Eunuch. Then World War II broke out and he flew over 50 B-17 bombing missions in the European theater. And after the war, he moved to Daytona Beach, Florida, because he flew over it a few times in the Air Force and thought it looked pretty good. And he set up Smokey's best damn garage in town in 1947. Cocky? Yes. True? Also yes. And pretty soon, his mechanic skills were noticed by a local stock car owner named Marshall T, who started Smokey's career with the legendary Hudson Hornets. He started work as a mechanic on Herb Thomas's car, helping him win 39 races and two Grand National Championships between 1951 and 1954. That gave him enough credit to move up to Pontiac in 1959, and it was at Pontiac where he achieved his greatest successes. His good friend and racing driver Fireball Roberts won the Daytona 500 in 1961 and 1962, the first time in NASCAR history that a driver won the Daytona 500 back-to-back. -back. And with another pole position earlier on in 1960, they became the first to get three Daytona pole positions in a row. And that wouldn't be the last time that Smokey upset the order at Daytona. Let's set the scene. It's the mid-1960s, and Chrysler and Ford are in an all-out battle for NASCAR supremacy. Chrysler's 426 versus Ford's 427. And yet, in the midst of this rivalry, at the 1967 Daytona 500 qualifying session, a privateer Chevy Chevelle sponsored by Smokey's Garage stole pole position with a ridiculous 180 mile an hour lap. All of the factory teams just got smacked by a privateer with a car from a manufacturer that doesn't even race. And then during the Daytona 500 itself, the Chevy started smoking and they retired the car. Now officially, Smokey claimed it was the engine failing. But if you believe those who wear tin foil hats, Smokey bowed out because he was under intense scrutiny from NASCAR, and winning the biggest event of the year with ease might push them beyond their tolerances of him. As to why he was under such scrutiny, needs an explanation. The first reason is because Smokey and NASCAR's management did not see eye to eye on the fundamentals of safety. As in, Smokey nearly beat Bill France with a four pound hammer. The reason why he nearly murdered the head of NASCAR is because in general, Safety wasn't really considered in any racing series in the world at that time. But after a violent crash made Fireball Roberts die after 40 days of agonizing pain, Smokey stepped up his efforts to make NASCAR safer, even developing some of the first safer barriers by building walls out of tires and plywood to absorb impacts. But that costs money. And besides, everybody knows the risks. So NASCAR was not in the mood for listening, and all of his recommendations were blown off. The other reason NASCAR hated him was his masterful manipulation of the rulebook. When you think of Smokey Eunuch, this is what you think. But in Smokey's mind, he looked around the paddock and saw nothing but a bunch of cheaters and NASCAR officials who were either too incompetent or too lazy to do anything about it. So in an act of protest, he went to war. The Chevy Chevelle that humiliated Chrysler and Ford at Daytona was arguably Smokey's crowning achievement. He was, and still is, a underappreciated master of aerodynamics, and the Chevelle reflects that. Now, there were a few 
Chevelles built, and for the sake of simplicity, we're going to say they were pretty much all the same, despite some minor differences. It's been called a 7 8 scale Chevelle, based on a rumor that he took each dimension of a normal Chevelle and shrunk it to 7 8 scale to reduce the surface area and therefore reduce drag. That is wrong. In a 2019 Amazon Prime documentary, they actually measured the real car, and all of the dimensions were pretty much identical. Well, I mean, the ride height and the roof line were dropped considerably, the front bumper was recessed and sculpted into an air dam, and a divot was placed in the roof line to act as a wing. And that's just a start. The panel fitment was so precise that just opening the door scratched the paint, the floor was flat to minimize turbulence underneath the car, and the entire body was offset about two inches backwards on the chassis. Now if you're wondering, A, how the hell did he do that? And B, why the hell did he do that? I'll answer B first and get to A a little bit later. By placing the roof further back, the air pressure going off the windshield is located closer to the center of the car, therefore making it more stable. And all that's just the skin. The internals are equally ingenious. A banking like Daytona puts a lot more stress on the right side of the car than the left. So if you make the car flatter with respect to the banked road surface, it can be a lot more stable. But in order to do that, you have to put as much weight bias as possible on the left side of the car. So that's what he did. Everything was shifted over as far as possible to the left. Even the driver's shoulder was rubbing against the door. But there was a problem. The rules say that the engine must be perfectly between the frame rails. So Smokey shifted the frame rails, and therefore the engine off center to the left. And going back to part A of that aforementioned question, this was all somehow legal because NASCAR had a rule which permitted that a frame can be substituted from a manufacturer. So, Smokey became a manufacturer and built his own frame and fitted his own body in the proportions of a Chevelle. Yep, the 7-8 scale Chevelle wasn't even a Chevelle. It was NASCAR's first silhouette racer. In many ways, it shares a lot more in common with a modern stock car than an older stock car. It was also so far over the top that as soon as it retired from the race, NASCAR filled in all the exploited gaps in the rulebook. Now, the Chevelle embodies his fight against the establishment, but it was by no means his only trick. He made his windows out of Lex Sandwich cause his car to be 100 pounds underweight. Weight that he then made up by piling it on G, the left side of the car. Or one time where he built a fuel tank too large for regulations, stuffed a basketball in it, and then inflated the basketball so his fuel tank would be certified as correct when they tested it. And then he would simply deflate the fuel tank to add in more fuel for the race itself. Or during qualifying one time, he had wheel covers on his car, making it much more streamlined and easily take pole position. But this time, nobody complained. In fact, they laughed, thinking he wouldn't be able to change his rear tires. And they were right. So after qualifying, Smokey simply cut off the panels and ran the car normally during the race, starting on pole position. All of this meant he was inspected a lot. And one race, he was handed a list of nine things to change on his car, a list so exhaustive he couldn't do it in the time frame given. So he turned his car over, shouted over the engine to the dumbfounded inspectors, make it 10, and drove back to his garage. Why were the inspectors dumbfounded? Because they were still holding his fuel tank. Turns out Smokey read the rule book and saw that there were no rules about the dimension of your fuel line, only you had to have one. So he made a 2 inch diameter, 11 foot long fuel line that could apparently hold 5 gallons by itself. But eventually, even legends get caught by the law. The restrictions placed upon him and the frequent blow-offs about safety made Smokey leave NASCAR altogether in 1970. So let's shift to that other oval race. The Indy 500, he first competed in 1957 and got crashed into on lap 1. Then in 1959, he got the reverse torque special, another one of his ingenious creations. It was built with the sole purpose of seeing if the direction of engine rotation affected lap times. You see, all drivetrain components rotate counterclockwise for reasons of just tradition. And in theory, if you make those internals run clockwise, the load distribution can be improved on tracks of left-hand corners only, i.e. Indianapolis. Seems like a simple switch, right? 
Wrong. So very, very, very wrong. <laughs> Smokey paid Offenhauser an unspecified amount to make a custom reverse rotation engine and then bought specific drivetrain components used in Howe brand front wheel drive and all wheel drive racers to get the thing working. Did it work? Yes, but also no. The car finished in a respectable seventh place, but it was definitely not worth the exorbitant amount of time and money spent on it. And then just to prove that point, his car won the 1960 Indy 500 while being traditional. But that win didn't stop Smokey from experimenting. In 1962, he mounted a Watson Special Roadster to a wing, and it was by far the best handling car out there, but since people are still figuring out this whole wing concept thing, it added so much drive that it was too slow for Indianapolis. And that's probably a major contributing reason for why wings wouldn't be seen in Indy until the 1970s. He was so far ahead of his time that they didn't really understand the physics of it, and it was too slow, so people looked at wings and said, that wouldn't work. You see? We don't need those on our cars. So, ambitious but rubbish, if I can quote my favorite TV show. And that would mean his last big swing at Indy was the Hearst Floor Ship Special, a.k.a. the Capsule Car. Again, thinking back to his time with the Chevelle, the more weight on the left, the more stable the car will be. So, Smokey put the engine in fuel cell where the driver would normally be on an open wheeler, and put the driver in a tiny side pod hanging on for dear life. And at a time where Indy didn't have a fuel capacity limit, that space in the center was much larger than a standard fuel tank, so the car could run the entire 500 miles on a single tank, while still having a more consistent center of mass. But the theory didn't really translate to speed, and it failed to qualify, bringing his Indianapolis adventures to a rather anticlimactic, if not interesting-looking, end. Now, while he was doing everything I mentioned so far, Smokey saw the release of the new 1967 Camaro, and thought it was a good fit to, you know, break an FIA time trial and class speed records. And to mess around with a Trans Am team, but that comes later. In the meantime, Smokey built a small and big block engine layout for his Camaros, specifically two small blocks making 450 horsepower, and one big block making 540 horsepower. And like his Chevelles, they had lowered floor plans, smoother windshields, smooth panel gaps, reshaped fenders, and yes, an abscess dipped body. It was not just Penske that did it, Penske was the only one that took it actually racing against other cars, that is a caveat. And he left for his scheduled time slot at the Bonneville Salt Flats way ahead of schedule because he wanted to take a little detour past Utah to California September 1967, specifically Riverside Raceway where Bud Moore and his Mercury Trans Am factory team were prepping for an upcoming race. And that Mercury team began noticing some strange events occurring. First Hot Rod Magazine writer Jim McFarland showed up out of the blue Followed quickly by Smokey, with his Camaro being towed behind a 1950s farm truck. Then a Goodyear representative rolled out four fresh racing tires, followed by an IndyCar driver named Lloyd Ruby. And that concoction sent the Camaro out for a quick track session. Now the Mercury guys thought reasonably that that Camaro was going to be their upcoming competition for the Trans Am season. And they began looking at their watches and saw the warm-up times were about average for their class. Then Smokey gave the signal, and Ruby proceeded to shatter the lap record three times on the trot before pulling into the pits and leaving. The awestruck Mercury team looked at Smokey in horror, thinking that car that just obliterated the previous lap record was their competition. And just to reinforce this point, Smokey loaded up his car, shouted at them, I'll see you sons of bitches later, and went to Bonneville. He didn't have to do that. He went way out of his way. But he did that just to mess with them, and I kind of love that. A lot. <laughs> and when he raced at Bonneville, Smokey claimed his Camaros broke over 500 speed records over 12 days, with speeds approaching 185 miles an hour in a quote-unquote factory car. Is that number really accurate? Who's to say? Smokey has a long history of exaggerating, but definitely some records were set with those Camaros at Bonneville. But it's not just racing that he had a lasting influence. 
he had a lot of innovation besides his safer barriers. The Chevy small block V8 engine family is one of the all-time greats with over 65 million produced in the 20th century alone. But it almost didn't happen. Chevy wasn't going to do any factory racing from the 1950s to 1960s, so all of their racing had to go through privateers. Regardless, Smokey went to work with GM's best engineer to develop a V8 to rival Ford in NASCAR starting 1954, and with Smokey's know-how and Zora Arcus Duntoff's encouragement, the engine was refined to be more reliable. When it was ready in 1955, the 4.3-liter, four-barrel carb V8 made 195 horsepower in road trim, and it was used in both the NASCAR program and the Bel Air and the Corvette, and from there on out, GM would never be the same as the V8 legacy is still being felt in their cars today. And that was not the last engine that he worked on. As the 1970s wore on, he saw the collapse of the American auto industry and the death of high-powered engines. And he decided there must be a way to produce a fast car while still being efficient. So he started with that. Efficiency. A normal gasoline engine is at best 25% efficient with 75% being lost to exhaust or heat energy, standard conservation of energy stuff for all my engineering nerds out there. But, if you could use the heat energy loss to vaporize the very fuel going into the cylinders, it would be a lot more efficient. So, Smokey took a Pontiac Fiero and his Iron Duke 4 cylinder, added a heat exchanger and a homogenizer, which is basically a fancy turbo that runs off exhaust gases, but instead of pushing more air into the cylinders, it pushes air through an intake manifold wrapping around the exhaust, which heats the air up to 450 degrees. That air then goes to heat up the fuel, making it vaporize more efficiently. So the 2.5 liter gas vapor engine in his Fiero made 250 horsepower and 250 torque when the normal car could only muster 90 horsepower. So it was twice as fast as a normal Fiero to 60 and still got 51 mpg on the highway. It was a great car, and its numbers were certified by both the EPA and the Big Three. And the best part is, it was an engine addition, it wasn't a different engine entirely. They didn't change any key components, it was essentially a multiplier of performance. Smokey estimated that gas vapor engines made 1.8 horsepower per cubic inch. It should have been the tech to give Detroit a leg up on its new Japanese rivals, but typically they never took it. They were stuck steadfast on their existing methods like catalytic converters. And you know what? To be fair to Detroit, gas vapor engines are expensive. And if you don't run them absolutely perfectly, they either wouldn't reach their expected efficiency levels, or they would detonate. Yeah, not great. And to be honest, they're not going to be very useful now because the efficiency issue has been solved with electric vehicles and they're 95% efficient electric motors, so there's simply no reason to use it. And even if you did want to use it, Smokey took most of his knowledge about it to the grave when he passed away in 2001. But you know what? He did leave behind a hell of a legacy. He was inducted into both the International Motorsport Hall of Fame and the Motorsport Hall of Fame of America. And although he may never get inducted into the NASCAR Hall of Fame for obvious reasons, nobody outside those walls can deny that he was the best damn mechanic in the sport.